Thank you all for, man, if you were an adult who went on the Rev Retreat, I want to say thank you. Like, you have sacrificed your health and your well-being and your mental stability for the next couple of weeks, and I want to say thank you. If students who went, man, thanks for going, for braving the heat, you know? I heard it was, what, like 85 all weekend in Arkansas, right? It was great. Um, <laughs> So, man, super fun. Thank you. And for those of you who invested in that ministry and being able to make that happen, thank you. Honestly, that's what it's about, being able to be able to be generous and to give into what God is doing in the lives of people. I don't know if you're paying attention right now, uh, but God is literally doing amazing things. Like if you saw there were salvations and baptisms, and today we had baptisms and salvation. Next week, we've got 27 people, and I think there's more now, in the first service who were hearing about uh, getting baptized next week. So it's going to be, again, another week with more baptisms, more salvation. Like people are coming to Jesus because he's, he's like waking up our soul. He's waking up our eyes. He's opening people's eyes up to what's going on around us. We're like, we need the truth. We need Jesus. We need, we need to really encounter him. And that's what we believe in this church. We want to have life transformation in God's presence, right? Like we are people who say, that's what we want. We don't want to just play church. We don't want to just come in and hey, sing some songs, hear a good message and go home. We literally want it to change us. That's what it's about. Last week, um, you know, we've been in James for a while. James is not like a patty cake kind of book, right? Like it is a get in your face and wake us up. And that's what I hope is that the book of James, as he's pouring out from the spirit, man, just like, please, he's like pleading with us to step into real faith. And so, man, and we're in week eight now. We're in James chapter three, verses 13 through 18. And I want us to do what we've been doing, which is to stand up. I'm going to read the word of God over us. And then we're going to get in today's message and it's going to be just, I, I just believe again that the Holy Spirit is going to just transform these words to just pierce our heart and draw us into something, just to the deeper knowledge of God. So let's, let's look at it here. It says James chapter 3, verses 13 through 18. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. And peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. Let's pray. So Father God, we pray that you would take these words of yours today and just open these words and make them come alive in our heart today, in our minds, and just be able to see you more clearly. Holy Spirit, have your way in this room. This church is yours. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You guys can have a seat. So last week I started off the message and I said there's a couple things this world needs. And we talked about it. We all agreed. What does the world need? It's Jesus. Right? Like the world needs Jesus. We know it, we see it, we feel it. And then the second thing I brought up is what we're going to really lean into today, which is this. Our churches need to be people full of wisdom and understanding. We have to be wise and understanding. So today's message really is allowing for me to expand on and kind of lean into this particular area that you and I need to really grow in. This message is not for people outside of these walls. Today's message is for you. You have to make a choice and choose a path in your life. Many people choose Jesus and we get our feet set on that path and then sometime down the road, for some reason, the wind and the rain came and that firm foundation in which we were standing on sometimes led us off to the side. I watched a sports documentary about a, a man named Mauro Prosperi. He's Italian, so you know it's somewhere in that ballpark is his name. Um, Anyways, in 1994, he ran a, a ultra marathon through the desert of Morocco. Now, it's supposed to be a six-day run. And what I'm, not, what I'm not saying is, like, for six days in a row, you run a mile. You know, it's like one mile today, we stop, camp out in the desert, and then tomorrow we run. A, no, no, this is six days of just pure one, running from the moment the sun comes up to the sun goes down. You're just running and running and running for six solid days. Now, I thought, this feels a lot like life at times, doesn't it? There are those moments in life where you get to the starting line and everybody's there. You're all smiling, well hydrated, happy to go. Woo, we're going to do it, you know. 
the gun goes and everybody takes off running. And you know that first bit of life, especially in your journey with Jesus, when you're all running together, you're like, oh, like coming back from camp, you're all together, you're safe and happy. You know, it's like everything's going good. And then all of a sudden, a couple hundred miles into the run, you start realizing I'm all by myself. How many of you in your Christian walk have ever felt like, I feel like I'm all by myself? And you looked around the desert and you thought, there is no life out here and the sun is getting hotter. It's just me and the Lord out here trying to survive. Amen? Morrow, I think is his name, got lost. He was missing for nine days because in the midst of his run, he got off just a little bit when one of the storms came and forgot his path. And he ran for 180 miles in the wrong direction. I have met Christ followers who have been walking with Jesus and tragedy came and it was just enough to knock them off and they found themselves days later out in a wilderness, no one to be found, 180 miles off course. You see, the path that we choose to follow isn't the hardest part. It's actually choosing to stop and check our surroundings and make sure we're still on the right path. So for many people, I have this twofold kind of message today. One, I want you to choose the right path. If you've never chosen the path of wisdom and understanding, I want to teach you what that path is today. And then those of us who feel like we've been running on that path for a long time, I want you to know sometimes you can wake up in the midst of life storms. How many of you have had some storms in your life? You had the sand kick up, the winds blow, and you feel like, man, I just want to turn it in. But you realize I can't just walk back. I got to figure out how to get out of this race, right? You, you'll find yourself off and alone. And today I want to give you an opportunity to recenter your life on the path of wisdom and understanding. So let's look at the text. The first thing that he says is who is wise, right? James 3, 13 says, who is wise and understanding among you? I feel like whenever this verse was read, uh, ultimately uh, in the early church, that they started looking around, right? You're probably looking who's the wise one among us and you start thinking through who is it that could be the wisest and you're trying to think through the process of like what actually makes a person wise. And I think one of the things we think of is it's usually someone who gives great advice, right? Now, I started thinking this week about who gives great advice. I think one of the greatest people in our, in our history in America has been Martin Luther King Jr., gave great advice. Let me read you just a couple of his quotes. The ultimate measure of man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. How about this? Love is the only force capable of transforming an enemy into a friend. How about this one? Forgiveness is not an occasional act. It is a permanent attitude. Now, that's some great advice. Now, sometimes we'll think about someone who has humility, right? Who has humility and walks in it, you know, even though they're wise, but they have a lot of humility. And I always thought of Mother Teresa. You know, you grow up and you're like, she served her whole life. And so I thought there's a great quote from her. It says, self-knowledge puts us on our knees and it is very necessary for love. For knowledge of God gives love and knowledge of self gives humility, you ever looked at yourself and realized, I am broken and messed up? And man, when you start to look at your life, you realize, I am not as cool as I thought I was. We also typically will attribute wisdom with age and experience. There's a woman named Elizabeth Sullivan. She actually lived in Fort Worth, Texas. She was 104 years old uh, when she had an interview, and she said she drinks three Dr. Peppers a day. She gave this quote. She said, every doctor that sees me says they'll kill you, but they die and I don't, so there must be a mistake somewhere. <laughs> so sometimes it's not just experience. Your experience may be different from my experience. But ultimately, what is it to be wise? What is it to be understanding? If, if it's so important to James to try to get us to understand why as the church we're supposed to lean into this, wisdom is defined by Merriam-Webster says this, it's an ability to discern it's a good sense of judgment. It accumulates knowledge. Ultimately, like, it's just accumulation of things in our life that bring us into this place of wisdom. It's like all of the above. It's like D, all of them, right? That's the answer. It's a collection of them. You see, it's shown also, though, in our behaviors. How many of you know that whenever, when I was growing up, you ever watch those movies where like someone decides they're gonna go off and speak to a wise person, they need to get some wisdom? So they go on a long journey out into a vast wasteland. There's a mountain off in the distance with a giant castle, which I don't know who built that thing. So they climb up in there, they, they go through all the rugged weather, and they find this old, old, old person sitting there just in some chair randomly by themselves, hasn't showered in forever. You know, they haven't met people in I don't know how long. And they go in for wisdom from this person who's isolated themselves from the whole world. 
The problem with that is that that's not wisdom. You might have some intelligence or some knowledge. That's not wisdom. Because wisdom is something that affects your behavior and your attitude so that as you live your life, it pours out for others around you. That's real wisdom. Real understanding requires me to understand you and your point of view and your perspective. Which leads me to the next point, which is that wisdom is seen. Wisdom is not just something about like, oh, that's a really smart person. And that's a good person with some great intelligence. Oh, they're pretty humble. Yes, these are wise and understanding people. No, no, it has to be lived out in our lives. Do you realize, like I was preaching about this last week, that, that you have a calling in your life as you sit here today to take your wisdom and understanding, your knowledge of Jesus Christ, and to carry him into the world. How will anyone hear about Jesus unless you tell them? And I love in the Bible, a lot of times you think the pastor's job is to go evangelize and witness. That's not the case. My job is to equip you, the saints, to go and do the work, right? Like, like your job is to carry and to walk in all that God has called you to, to evangelize, to go share the gospel with people, to bring them into the knowledge. That's what it's about. So how are we supposed to be wise and understanding if we actually don't carry it into the world? It's supposed to be seen. James 3.13 goes on. He says, let them by, show it by their good life by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. Wisdom is lived out through a good life. Deeds are done from a place of humility. Wisdom is the fountain from which our behavior is acted upon. Wisdom does not exist in the mind. It transforms your actions. Did you catch that? Wisdom doesn't exist in the mind. It transforms your actions. This is what it means to be wise. Living out a sustained life. One of my biggest things for us as a church, for you as an individual, one is that you come to know Jesus. And I don't want you just to know Jesus. I want you to experience him the way I feel. Which is why I yell a lot, right? And I'm like, y'all be warned. <laughs> you know, it's like, I want you to get it, right? And I get so passionate. I'm like, man, if you could just feel the presence of God, if you could just really encounter him the way that I just, the man, when I read the scriptures and it leaps off the page and don't tell me you don't like reading, man, just wait until you read this. Like, it just, I want you to get it. Like, that's my whole, mm. Come on, you know, like that's how I feel sometimes. And it just gets a little wound up, me and Betty, you know, like we just get all fired up, you know. And I want you to believe it the way that I believe it and to see it and to feel it and to smell it and to taste it. Just like taste and see that the Lord is good. That means you got to eat, you know. So I want that. The second thing that I want, and I desire it in my innermost being, I want so bad for every one of you to have a sustained life walking out your faith. This, this path that I'm talking about, this path of wisdom, I want you to walk on it and not fall off. I want you to not get 180 miles off course. I want you to get two miles off course and go, wait a minute, somebody's whistling, come back. Like, get over here, like, stay with us. Let's keep going, let's stay on this journey. Do you know, it just hurts so bad to watch people who have one little thing create like this hiccup in their life and they just leave the church and they just leave God. It's just, I'm so mad, I'm so frustrated because God didn't do what I told him he should do. That's not wisdom. That's not understanding. That's not a knowledge. That's selfishness. And what I want so bad is for a group of people who have a sustained life walking out the gospel. You know how difficult it will be if we just have people just, it's like a rotating door in the back. People come in for a while, life was good, but man, when COVID hit, pff, I'll see you. Oh, things was good and then I lost my job. Pff, it's all, and then, oh, everything's going great, but my kids, pff, just, and the, one thing or another, something will cause you to question yourself. Listen, the Christian faith means you're gonna be in the desert and you're gonna look around one day and go like, man, where am I at? And God's like, I'm right here with you. You're like, but, but I feel alone. I feel isolated. I don't know what to do. He's like, but I'm here with you. You're like, I don't know. I don't know what I'm gonna do. I'm just, maybe I'll dig a hole. I'll just take off running. I don't and God's like, listen, I'm with you. And I want to beg the church. I want to plead with you as a person. Please, please, please pursue the face of God every chance you get. Stay with it. Realize, man, once I got on this path, there is no turning back. There's no walking out of this race. There is an end date, and I'm just going to keep running. I'm going to get everything I got. And when I wake up one day and realize I don't have all the answers today, I'm going to go, you know what? But I trust God. I trust God. Wisdom doesn't exist in the mind. It transforms our actions. I love how James starts off the whole book in chapter one. He says this, don't merely listen to the word so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Man, stick with it. Stay with the word. And he goes on. I love this because we're talking about wisdom, right? It produces action and it transforms our behavior. It strengthens our thought life, right? And it says in James 1, 5, if you lack wisdom, you should ask God. Right? If, if this wisdom that like draws you in and allows you to stay on track, there's too many people that have been affected by, by too many addictions that lead us astray. And we just need to get back to God and show me, Lord. 
Give me wisdom about this particular situation. Allow for God to speak about what has c- controlled you for too long. And when he speaks, listen and do what he says. Wisdom, though, it begins somewhere. Where does it start? I believe this. Wisdom starts with the knowledge of God. In the Psalms, it says that uh, it's a fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the fear of the Lord is not like, oh, I'm terrified. It is, it is a, I am consumed and I'm in awe of God. I, m- I remember there was a, we went to Hawaii one time and I just, I've always seen the, the ocean when it comes to the Gulf of Mexico. You know what I mean? You go to Galveston, those aren't waves. Port Aransas, I don't even know if they have waves, right? We don't have an ocean. We have a gulf. But when I went to Hawaii, man, I was standing on this rock and looking at the waves and they were just beating against this island. And I thought, I'm not getting in there. <laughs> There's no way. And you're just in all. I've gone to Colorado and seen the mountains. And you just look at them. You're like, oh, just, it's amazing. I mean, you just, you stand in awe of the things that God has created. And you just, you have this sense of awe and fear and reverence. You're like, oh, how? You know, I ain't playing with that, you know. But I want to be near it and I want to be around it. That's how I feel about God, right? He's so powerful, so mighty. Listen, some of us, we need to get used to the holiness of God, which means we have to have a little bit of fear and reverence as we step into his presence, realizing I gotta, I gotta knock some stuff off my life, right? You gotta, I gotta get rid of this stuff. I don't wanna touch it. If it's gonna affect my relationship with Jesus, I don't wanna, I don't wanna touch any of that stuff. That's a fear, that's a reverence, that's an awe. That's a, I'm gonna go after God with everything. Not be like, he gets my Sunday morning and I get the rest. Like we're on a path of following Jesus daily. Not, I put in a couple of good hours this week. This word, to know God, though, I remember studying it in the Greek, and it's the word gnosko. And gnosko in, in the Greek translation is not just to, to know him, but if you'll, you'll see it's to learn to know, to come to know, to get a knowledge and to perceive and to feel. If you look, it's even a Jewish idiom for sexual intercourse. Or you have to grasp it. You got to really think, this is a knowledge. It's like back and forth. This intimacy is really the word that is best. It's to have an intimate understanding of God. Right? So when you're like, yeah, I want to know God, it's like, no, no, do you really want to know God? Like the way that you're supposed to be in an intimate relationship with the Father. And it's not just that you know him, but it's this word, it's a relation between people knowing and the object being known. It's like, man, if I want to know you and you want to know me and we're coming into this, that's a gnosko. It's an intimacy. It's a relationship developed. So if the beginning of wisdom is to fully know God, it is to be in an intimate relationship with God. That's the beginning of wisdom. To be wise and understanding, it has a starting place. And the starting place is an intimacy with God. Now, let me ask you this question. How many of you can say you have an intimacy and a relationship like that with the Father today? Like, I just, I just cannot. I just have to be with Jesus. I have to, I'm so in love with Jesus. When I fell in love with Erica, man, I was traveling like eight hours up to Kansas just for a date. Do I drive eight hours for Jesus? I'm like, uh, awkward. You know, it's like... But how many of us really pursue it? Man, some of us have a hard time just getting out of bed for Sunday church, let alone like planning and organizing a date that's going to take a full weekend. You know, we're like, I don't know. The lake house sounds a whole lot nicer. I'm just saying it because I want it to really sink in. Are you on a path truly choosing to follow Jesus? One of, the, one of my favorite moments is leading people to Jesus, of course, right? It should be everybody's. I literally met with a man. Literally met with I did. I met with a guy this week, and we were talking, and, and he was raised in the church, Right? And sometimes I feel like, oh, we're at a disadvantage already. Because sometimes we've allowed for religion to take over and not a true intimacy of who God is. Because we get so accustomed to church and VBS and camps and it it gets so, you get used to it. You just, man, I loved it. It was a high. And then I just came off the high and I don't know what to do with myself. But I was trying to explain to him. I was like, listen, you got to put your life on the altar of Jesus and go after him with all you got. And he's like, that's, that's what I want. He's like, I walked the aisle one time and gave, you know, did the whole like prayer thing, but it just didn't change anything. I was like, yes, you need a life transforming encounter in God's presence that so radically shifts everything in your world. That's, that's what it means to get at the starting line and start, start walking this out. That's wisdom, right? I, if I want to know how to be wise and understanding, I need to know from the one who created me in my innermost being and how he made me and how he pieced me together. That's who's going to give me the best information in my life about me. You can't do it on your own. You can go up on a mountain and live in a castle and try to just really discover all the things. You're not going to find anything out except you're bored. 
So James begins to transition out of this, like to know God, to, to come into this relationship with him. And he's like, starts to remind us that wisdom also has this competing view in our world. James 3, 14 through 16 says, but if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. He says, such wisdom comes not, comes, does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and evil practice. Now, when we look in culture, right, because this is the perfect example, you should be looking in the church and you should see wisdom and understanding. You should see a new path, the path of righteousness, the how we walk out this relationship with Jesus Christ, this path of knowing him, that should be the path we're on. And then we look in the world and we find the opposite path, right? You see, Aristotle said it this way. He said, knowing oneself is the beginning of all wisdom. He's wrong. The, the truth is what scripture says is like the beginning of knowledge is to know God to be in fear of him, to have an awe and a reverence of, of the sacred and who he is as a person. Like lean into that. That's where it begins. Not in trying to know yourself. That's a dead end. How many times have we tried to like, I just, I'm gonna just need to step back and just get to know myself. Like if you look at the world, what happens? Yourself keeps changing constantly. You don't even know what you want anymore. You just keep, I was talking about, it's like you ever seen Pirates of the Caribbean? You know, Johnny Depp's got that little compass that follows his heart. It's always like this. That's what the world's moral compass looks like. Well, whatever's today, let's just follow that. It's gonna change and then it's gonna change and then we'll, get, we'll just figure out where we're going. And yet all of a sudden we get into scripture and now, now we have a compass. Now we know how to live our life. Now I know how to walk this out. I can be wise and understanding because I'm following the one that created it all in the first place. There's a book I'm reading called Strange New World by this man named Carl Truman. I want you to hear some quotes and just, just let these quotes sink in as you think, sink in when you think about culture today. His first one is, our cultures must now justify themselves purely on the basis of themselves. Boy, is that not our world right now? Like we get to that, we as a group of people are gonna define who we really are and what we want. He goes on, he says this, and that means that society's moral order defaults to pragmatism and put it crudely to the matter of who shouts loudest and has the most effective lobby groups. He continues, Arguments based on the authority of God's law or the idea that human beings are made in the image of God no longer carry any significant weight in a world devoid of the sacred. When you remove God from the equation, the only thing you have left is yourself. And when we are in a world full of people, individuals who wanna choose what their own right, their own morality, their own choice, their own, their own lifestyle, whatever they want, we find exactly what we have going on around us. Chaos. It says it in the scripture. It says in James 3, for where you have envy, selfish ambition, there you'll find disorder and evil practice. James 3, 14, though, as he's talking about this, I want you to hear this. He says, but if you harbor, right? You have to think about this. Where are you at in this? Because wisdom, one of the things that wisdom will do is it'll cause you to think you're smarter than you really are, and you can actually hurt people, Right? I was telling Erica this, I remember uh, when, I was, when I was younger and I was like following the Lord, man, I, was, I would take my Bible ever with me. I almost felt like it's an actual sword. Like I could fight off anybody with this thing. You know, that's not the truth, all right? We don't hit people with our Bible, okay? It's not like osmosis where the harder you hit them, the more it gets in. Like that's not how it works. And the truth is, here's the deal. You gotta listen to this. You can't yell at people enough to get them to change their heart. Like it, it will never happen. Who changes people's hearts? The Holy Spirit. That's who changes people's hearts. You, it has nothing to do with you other than you sharing and allowing for the Holy Spirit to move through you to shift and to change the hearts. What happens if you start sharing the gospel with somebody and they don't, and they're like, mm-mm, they're rejecting, they're getting mad at you? Stop, move on, pray for them. Go intercede in your quiet place, press in for them. You don't have to get in their face and yell, but if you just understand... Just, just look at all the topics in the world right now. I mean, there's some massive, when you start talking about transgender, when you start talking about abortion, when you start talking about all of these really big and weighty issues, right? I could probably start talking about it right now and we could just pander to some sort of base and we'll find out where I, we're just pushing people out the door immediately. And, and you start to feel, what, what, is this, what is this thing that's causing this like rift in the church and rift in the world? What, it's a spirit and it's not the Holy Spirit. Right? We're allowing for spiritual warfare to go on and we're just as blind as we can be. The scripture says that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and spirits, right? So in other words, there's a battle going on and, and typically in America now, we've, we've politicized everything. So there's two camps. There's Democrats and Republicans and the Christians just have to find their way in between and just get in line. And the truth is Jesus wants no part of it is what I think. 
He stands back. He's like, y'all are just yelling at each other. I don't even know what's going on. You're allowing for a spirit to just keep going back and forth. If we would just lean into the Holy Spirit, then when we start walking out in our anointed, grace-filled, Holy Spirit power, then all of a sudden when I start talking to somebody, I don't have to yell at them. I just allow for the Spirit of God to transform their heart. Now, that would probably revolutionize the way we get on social media. I really believe that this path that we're talking about should be filled with our ability to understand the scriptures here and know we got to be quick to listen, slow to speak. We got to realize that our tongue is anointed and it's on fire by the Holy Spirit so that when we share, it's going to change people's hearts. But we have to walk this out every day in wisdom and in understanding, knowing that the path that we're on is going to lead us to right where it's heaven on earth. It's right into the kingdom but we keep falling off the wayside because we get distracted. We get distracted by bitter envy and selfish ambition, right? It's this harsh zeal is what the scripture is really saying. It's, this, it's like we're just, we're so passionate about it. It's like a rivalry. We're, we're, we're fighting with other people. And, and I feel like what's happening is that God and others see this bitterness and this rigidity and this personal pride. And we're just taking it because we have a hill that we're going to die on. And then the selfish ambition, like I want to be bigger than I thought I want to. And we think we're doing it for the kingdom, but really it's just a self-seeking political pursuit. That word back in the day, like when, when Paul used it, it was literally describing politicians who, who do anything it takes to get into office. Now, I know y'all don't know anything about that. That doesn't, that doesn't happen in our day and time, you know? But, but can I just... Like we, we tend to like do whatever it takes to get into a position of authority. Can I tell you that, that people in the church do that all the time? We do whatever it takes to stand in a position of authority over somebody else and try to get them to believe our view. And I'm telling you, it's a spirit. It's a, it's a spirit of pride and a spirit of envy. And it's a spirit of just like anger. I guess. You know, it's just like all of it just trying to divide. And we are literally feeding into what's happening into the world. And yet this path that James is talking about that's full of wisdom and full of understanding does not require you to stand and yell at each other. And church, this message is for us, remember? This message is for us to sit back and realize, maybe I got off somewhere. Maybe, my, maybe when, when he brings up these things, I'm already mad at the pastor because does he actually believe what I believe? If you feel that, that's the spirit. It's the wrong spirit. The Holy Spirit says we need to come into unity, not disunity. And yes, guess what? There is a truth out there. Can I get an amen? There is a truth. And the world needs to know the truth, but the truth starts with who? Jesus. That is the path we have to stand on and start walking in. And it is a path of love a path of forgiveness, a path of repentance. It's full of people who are wise and understanding. Now, Paul, when he's writing in to the Corinthian church, he, he wrote in 1 Corinthians 8, he's dealing with this divisive issue about meat that was sacrificed to idols and Christians were eating and they're like, no, some people are saying no, other people are like, it doesn't matter. But I love what he has to say and I'm gonna pull the passion translation. You'll see them both up on screen here. He says this, now let me address the issue of food offered in sacrifice to idols. It seems that everyone believes his own opinion is right on this matter. How easily we get puffed up over our opinions. Here's what I love. But love builds up the structure of our new life. Church, wisdom and understanding is found in Jesus Christ. And when you choose that path, say, I'm gonna walk in the path of Jesus to come into wisdom and understanding. You have to realize that God is love and I am just consumed by love and I can walk out this love so that in this way, in this lifestyle that I'm living, in my actions, in my thought life and in my behavior, everything is shifted into the place of love in my new life. We have a new life. And it doesn't look like what the world maybe tries to force us into to get into these divisive fights, but just to walk in comfort and peace knowing there's no division. It's just Jesus Christ. Yeah, y'all are divided, but I'm not. I'm under Jesus. Man, come on. And it's love. I, just, I, love, I love how the scripture says that it is the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. It's not that the church yelled loud enough to bring people into repentance. It's the goodness of God. I'm gonna close up in James 3, 18. He says, peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. That's what it feels like when you walk in this way, when you walk in peace, when you walk in love, when you walk in wisdom and understanding for a lifetime, not on a weekend, but for a lifetime, you sow into this world peace and you get to reap righteousness. And whose righteousness? It's not yours. It comes from the Father. It's Jesus' righteousness. That's how we get to live. That's the path I want you to choose today.
So as we get ready to wrap up, today we have communion. Okay, so there's gonna be tables across the room. If you need gluten-free, it's back there. But I say, I say this because I, I want the message to come back to Jesus. Some of you, maybe at any point today, if there was a moment in your, in, in when you're thinking or just processing, man, you felt like, yeah, but he doesn't understand. Or no, I want to fight, but I'm, I'm still arguing with people. About, like, just remember, like, allow for the Lord to just gently bring you back into and show you, hey, you got off just a little bit. Let's get back on this path. Follow me. Don't follow your emotions. Don't follow your pride. Don't follow your envy and your jealousy. Just follow me. Because where we start walking in peace, we're going to reap the righteousness of Christ, right? We're going to continue to walk this out. So at the end of the day, man, we get to take communion. But communion is one of the most sacred moments that you get to have with Jesus. It is a literal moment of putting into your mouth the body, drinking, like just, it's the, uh, it's a representation of his blood. Like it's, it's like you get to have that intimate moment with him reflecting back, man, the last time he did this on earth, he was with his disciples in the upper room. And now you get to partake and you get to be a part of that moment with him. But there's this part in first Corinthians 11 that says this, it says, so that whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be, get, be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. Listen, I love this scripture. It says to examine yourself before you take communion. And today I want you to examine yourself before you take communion. I want you to think, Holy Spirit, have I gotten off path? Do I need to be walking with you? Do I need to stay with you? Do I need to give my life to you? You shouldn't take communion if you've never given your life to Jesus. It's an act of just obedience to the Lord to receive his body, his blood in your life, just the authority and the power that he's given us. And you get to consume that and, and take that in. So this morning, just sit for a moment and examine your life. Do I need to come back into alignment with the way of Jesus? So right where you're at, if you feel like, man, I need, to, I need to come into this. I need to do this. You need to just pray that to him right now. Lord, I'm coming back to you. I may have fallen off the path. I may have gone off a different direction. I may have allowed my emotions to take me one way or the other. But Lord, I'm, I'm coming back to you. I want to stay with you. I want a sustained life with you. It says in the scriptures that we are hidden in Christ. I want the world to see nothing but Jesus. Now from that place of reverence, I want us to stand up together and I want you to go to your tables. You can go with your family. You can go with individuals. I want you to be able to take communion. When you get the bread and the, and the juice, take it where you're at, come back over, kneel at the other, whatever you need to do. And we're gonna get into some worship right now during this time.
So if you're holding the cup and the juice, or the juice and the bread, I mean, like, go ahead and take it right now. It's just, it's for wherever you're at, it's for you. It's just a moment between you and the Lord today. If I can have the prayer team, if, if you guys will just come down and stand up towards the front, y'all are fine right there. Just get off to the sides here a little bit. As if any at any time during today, man, if you felt like there's a stirring in your heart, the Lord's been speaking, if you want somebody to pray with you, if you need prayer for healing, pray for encouragement, if you just need somebody to love on you for a second, I want you to just, you can come down here in a second. I'm gonna go ahead and have you stand up. You can stand right where you're at. Yep, come on, you can just stand up. And I'm gonna pray over us. I've always believed that some of the wisest people among us are the ones who are the quickest to repent and turn. And so it's never a shame or a dishonor for you to acknowledge, man, I know where I'm at and I don't need to be there. I'm gonna run to the Lord. That's what I want for us, man. Whenever we mess up, when we sin, when we turn, man, we are the quickest people to turn back to God. That is wisdom, that is understanding. So I'm gonna pray over us today. So Father God, I just thank you for today that we could come and that we could worship, that we could just lift up our hearts to you. We thank you for the salvations in the room. I thank you, God, for what you've done in our students. God, I thank you for what you're doing in us. And God, I pray that you would send us. 
that God, you would anoint us to carry out your vision, to carry your words, that God, you would trust us the way that you have is just already astounding. But God, we just pray that we would lean into this journey with you, God, that we would live what, what it is that we actually believe, God. Help us to fix our eyes on you today. We just thank you. And in Jesus' name, everybody says, amen.